So I think I've succumbed to the plague that's going around. Fun. <laughs> yeah, is this bad? Did anybody else caught this? Oh yeah, somebody's over there coughing up something. It's uh, <clears throat> it's rather unpleasant. Not fun to not you can't sleep. So if you can avoid it, avoid it. I can thank my daughter for giving me this. So here we thought we kicked her out of the house and that'd be the end of it. Get her married off and now she's somebody else's problem. She still manages to get me sick. So thanks a lot, Brittany. She's not even here for me to point my finger at her. It's even worse. All right. We are in the book of Hebrews chapter 6. And um, as with all of these, you know, the, the, the um, books of the Bible... They are uh, put out for us in in uh, order of chapters, and uh, most of the time there's kind of a moving on, if you will, of of thought. But in this case, as we find it in a number of other places throughout the Bible, there really is a continuation of thought. And so from chapter 5, the problem that we had uh, that he points out was one of what happens with apathy. And, you know, in the Christian walk, the important thing is that we move from conversion to discipleship. So the problem with, uh, with these people is that they stayed in their infancy. And uh, so whoever it is that he's addressing in this, in this uh, letter that's written to them, of course the people that he has his focus and his attention on is this group that still seems to be in their infancy. And then he gives them that warning at the end of chapter 5, but he continues it into chapter 6. So uh, we'll be there uh, tonight, again, chapter 6, we might do a little bit of just uh, a review very, very quickly. And then I, w- I just want to ask kind of a series of questions, because chapter 6 is a chapter that causes so much controversy uh, because of, of uh, the warning that it gives. And, and really, uh, you can read what people have to say, I even read what Pastor Chuck had to say on it, and uh, you can see it gives people uh, a real nervous little shiver down their spines when they start to look at this, depending on who you believe he's speaking to here. So we'll take a look at all of that kind of stuff. And before we start, just something that kind of struck me, and and, uh, I think it really does kind of go right to the heart of what we're talking about here. From the end of chapter 5 and into chapter 6, there's a real danger for believers to come to a place where they have uh, come to know who the Lord is and they get saved and God begins his great work in them to not take the time to really genuinely know God's word. And so when you survey uh, so much of what's being done in the name of God through the church, a lot of times what you get is very one-sided in what's being presented. So often you'll hear the same sermon topics go over and over and it's always such a rosy picture that's being painted and that's great because God is the God of love and grace and compassion and mercy and all that stuff there is no doubt about that absolutely but you can't take a look around the world and try to tell everybody that hey things are just great man it's uh, you know the sun will come out tomorrow and have a little chorus of Annie going on right it's uh, the interesting thing that the scripture does it gives us a context for what's happening in the world. It tells us that these things would be kind of the case. And the fact that God is loving and merciful and gracious and that we have hope and we have trust and all the rest of that stuff is what makes, it, it's what makes that stuff that's going on around the world uh, able, we're able to cope with it because we realize that this is not the forever home. So uh, that's something that I just think is so very, very important that we recognize. Yeah, the world is melting down. Shocker, right? Uh, It's kind of what I would expect if I understand what the scripture says. Things will not continue forever. They won't. And the scripture says that. So the question then becomes, well, when do those things take place? When is all that stuff going to happen? And what are the signs? And so we start to see them happening all around us. Now, is God, is it capable or is God capable and, and will he put the lid back on everything and will everything simmer down and everything be kind of cool? I don't know. But if not, uh, this is kind of what you would expect to see in these times and, and, and it makes God's love for his, his faithful that much cooler to take into consideration that if the Lord returns, we're not in a place of being unprepared for such a thing. In fact, it is when we see those things taking place around us in the world that it makes us want to just hold on to the Lord that much tighter and thank him for making our eyes open to such things and that he gives us a hope that's forever. Isn't that cool? So as we study tonight, 
keep that in the back of your mind because you know you see so much chaos and everybody's running around with their hair on fire. What's going to happen? What are we going to do? And everybody's just going after each other and it's just crazy. And you just think, God has not called us to that. He's given us way too much information in his word that we should not be running from crisis to crisis. He hasn't called us to that. So, pretty cool stuff. Hebrews chapter 6. What we have in front of us is one of probably the most controversial chapters that you're going to find, certainly in Hebrews, no question about that. This one in chapter 10, we've already looked at some of the warnings that have, that have been uh, in this book up to this point, but this one starts to use some language that gives people real, real pause. And it's interesting, you can tell what school of theology they come from based on how they answer the question. So maybe some of you already know where we're going with this. It's in verses 4 and 5, and it is really, really telling. So what we'll do is we'll look at the various views of this, and I'll just ask some questions. And I'll do some of that before we even read the text, because I want to get ourselves into kind of the right frame of mind as we read this, just asking questions. So with that, let's turn to chapter 6, and let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness to us. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you have given us your Holy Spirit, that we can understand such things. We can come before you seek you out and ask that you would give us understanding in these matters, knowing that it is very troublesome to so many people. But we thank you that you have given us this assurance that those who trust in you, your finished work at the cross, the work of redemption, and the blood that atones for the sin of mankind, if we take that, believe it, appropriate it, we are indeed saved. And so we thank you for that. We can have that assurance. We always can know. So we give you thanks and praise and ask God that you would help us to grasp these deep truths. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So just questions. When you think of this book, it doesn't talk about all kinds of different sins, like some of Paul's writings. That you know He, he deals with matters of sin, and, uh, and sometimes he'll give you a whole list of different things that would be sinful. In Hebrews, we really don't get that. What we get over and over when it talks about sin, the, the sin that would be recognized and identified here deals with unbelief. That's really the thing that, that uh, the writer of Hebrews is trying to be sure that his readers are careful about. Unbelief is the sin that, that would really create an eternal consequence, as we'll read tonight. And the reason for that, and we see that it's, it's specific to a group of people that would have knowledge of going back to a system like in the law that couldn't save. And so we need to understand this, that when Jesus came and died and resurrected and ascended, and he paid the price for sin, then anything that had been before was now made null and void. Now, the law itself, it's, I want to be careful when I say null and void, it means that Jesus then nullified the consequences of the law towards the believer because he paid the price that that would have caused. The law tells you, here's how to be perfect. Every one of us walks away from that saying, I'm a failure. Well, that means that we're still responsible for everything that the law laid out, unless, of course, we've come into a relationship with Jesus and he perfected all the elements of the law. And so we can look at him and say, the, the, the law stands, but he's nullified the consequence to those who believe in him. Okay, are we all clear on that? So that's why you'll notice that the arguments are all based upon Old Testament thought. So it's all based upon the priesthood. It's based upon the offerings. He's greater than the angels. He's greater than the prophets. He's greater than all these things. That's to a very Jewish mentality. You wouldn't take this book and hand it to a bunch of pagans. It wouldn't make any sense to them. So the book itself deals with a particular type of sin, one of unbelief. That's why the warnings are so important for us to understand. So no other sins are, are addressed. Um, this would never be said. These arguments would, would I, in my opinion, you wouldn't make these arguments to unbelievers because unbelievers wouldn't care. So as we get to the first few verses of chapter 4, this is why we have to start asking ourselves the questions. Who is the addressee of this book? Now, there's one particular uh, word that he has to say to them that gives us a little bit of an understanding. But I'm, I'm very much settled on this, that he's writing to believers. And the warnings are to the believers. Now, we will have, and when we get to the, the verses, there are those that would completely disagree with that. 
that uh, it is written to people who have known everything but never actually got to the point of being born again. They just played church. So that's one of the views that can be looked at. So the question is, let me just look at verse uh, 1 of chapter 3 before we go, and we will be coming back to it in just a moment. But when I read chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Jesus Christ. To me, as I read that, I would think he's talking to fellow believers because he includes himself among them, our high priest. Okay, And there are other places where he does a similar kind of a thing. If we're going to take the opinion that chapter 6 is talking to unbelievers, then he has changed his audience. And you don't know where. I can't tell you where because it, it's not clear from the text. If we're going to just go where the text takes us, then we just read it straight up what it is. So, in chapter 6, we have this. Therefore, leaving the discussion of elementary principles... The elementary principles are the same things that he was just talking to them about. You should, by this time, he says, you should be teachers. But instead, because you just haven't grown up, you're still drinking milk. And you haven't even begun to partake of meat. And he, he ends the, the chapter by talking about how, in a spiritual sense, because they had become so stagnant, so indifferent, and they had gone to the place of apathy, that they had actually, in a spiritual sense, they had atrophied because of the lack of exercise, spiritually speaking, which is a pretty scary thought that we could get to that place. So the warning is put out here that you people here, chapter 6, verse 1, I believe, he's speaking to believers and he says, we should be leaving the discussion of these elementary principles of Christ. So then let us go on to perfection. There's your options. We could stay in the elementary things and we see the consequence of it, we can get to the place where, as I had jokingly said last week, you could be the 40-year-old you know, uh, believer that's been around the church for 20 years, but you're still wearing diapers and you know, having a bottle prepared for you because you can't even eat solid food. And how ridiculous is that? And so he says, we want to go past that. Let us go on to perfection. That means maturity. There's no such thing as a perfect Christian. But there are those, those people that we would consider mature. And how do you know them? Well, because of what they know, what they do, how they conduct themselves, what their life is like. Those are great indicators of maturity. So let's move on to those things. And he says, let's not again lay the foundation or the edifice, the framework, if you will, of repentance from dead works to faith in God or faith towards God. So why go back to that? We should be already settled on that. And yet his point is, why are we still running in circles on this? And so I remember when I first got saved, we were going to a church that was very, very big on evangelism, which is great. And you would see people come down at the invitation. Every single service was, the, the, the study of, of the scripture was very much dedicated to evangelism. And so people would come down and get saved every single time that we were there. It's amazing. And then I came here and I thought, well, that doesn't happen here. What's wrong with this church? But then, the longer that I sat here, the more I realized, <coughs> I'm learning more about the Bible in this place in a week than I did in, in weeks and months at the other place. And it wasn't anything wrong with that because there's a need for evangelism, no question about it. But a steady diet of evangelism doesn't really tend towards a whole lot of growth. And so what God wants to do is move us from that place of infancy, of the evangelism part of it, and then let's move them on to a maturity based upon the Word of God. Get them out of their infancy and into their adulthood. And so that's what took place here, and it, it took a little while for me to figure that out. I was an infant, so all I knew was milk. But then, after a while, you're exposed to the meat of the Word of God, and you grow like leaps and bounds if you avail yourself to it. So, he says, let's move on to maturity. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and from faith towards God. So dead works was their attempt to try to do the things, the elements of the law that would find approval as far as God was concerned. But from God's perspective, there's no need for those things any longer because he's provided Jesus for us. The one who has kept every element of the law perfectly, therefore, he's absolved us from our need to try to work out things through the law that no man could do. 
So let's move past that, is his point. Why are we even entertaining the thought of going back to a system that God would not recognize as far as a salvation kind of a situation is concerned? So, verse 2 says, of the doctrines of baptisms. That's of ceremonial washings, the idea of cleansing the outside or the external. So there were plenty of those types of things that they did. There were all the ceremonies of washing hands, washing the body, the mikvahs and all that, and going through them before you would go to the temple and, and those kind of things. And so of the laying on of hands, and we know that that was done if you go back to the sacrifices, there was always the laying on of hands, which was the transferal. If it was in a sacrificial sense, it was the transferal of their guilt. If we think of it in the New Testament terms, when they would be praying over somebody, there would be the laying on of hands. But these are all elementary things that he's talking about. We don't need to go back and talk about these things. Repentance from dead works, uh, the doctrine of baptism, the laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and then of eternal judgment. We don't have to keep going over that stuff. Any believer that has you know, spent any time around Bible study, even in their infancy, pretty much knows that stuff. There's a day coming when God will resurrect the dead. And so we understand that. The idea also of eternal judgment, that there's a consequence for sin, and God, God uh, uh, deals with that. We know all of these things from a most basic elementary view. But think about the stuff that has already been spoken of here in the book of Hebrews, and this is really depth of doctrine and theology, and it's way past these things. So he says, we've got to move to this place of maturity. And he says in verse 3, and this we will do if God permits. I believe what he's saying here is that that moving on from the elementary things, moving on to maturity is what we will do if God gives us the time to do it. Now, he pivots. And in verse 4 says some things, verses 4 and 5, that really, really cause people some serious, serious heartburn. So here it is. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, become partakers of the Holy Spirit, have tasted the good word of God, and the powers of the age to come, means the strength of the age to come, understanding what will be taking place after. Now, when you see those titles, or those, those descriptions of people, there are basically a couple schools of thought in this. There are some that would look at what, we're, what we've just read there. Actually, let's look at verse 6 because it goes with it as well. If they fall away. And that falling away there is the only place where this is mentioned. It isn't mentioned anywhere else, that, that phrase right there. Now, there is a falling away that we know from other ones. But as far as the Greek, this is the only place where this word is used. Uh, parapepto is the, the Greek word for it. Now, the only place where this is mentioned, and it really means just what it says, a falling away or a moving away from what they had once professed. So the question is, is it just a hypothetical? Like it can't even possibly happen. That's one of the possibilities, and I don't think the text even begins to leave that option open. So I'll just put that one off. That's one of the propositions, but it doesn't have any biblical support. There are two others. And the first one would be, there are people who have come all the way up to the very last moment, maybe, before they would actually make that decision for the Lord, but they never actually did. They've been exposed to the word, the Holy Spirit's moved upon their hearts, but they've never accepted, they've never received. That's one of the options. The other option is that they are genuine believers, and the warning is that they could, of their own free will, abandon what it was that they once believed. Those are your two options that I think are the most, you know, most obvious that you could look at from this text. Now, one of the, the descriptions, if you will, that I think is very, very important, and I'm not, I'm not going to try to persuade anyone. I know that, that this is something that people get very, very upset about when you try to take a stand on it one way or the other. I do have an opinion. I'll share it with you in a moment. I already have, by the way. But when I look at this, the... The descriptions that are here, this idea of partakers, partakers of the Holy Spirit. I want to point that one out because let's just look at all, all of these descriptions one more time. It would be impossible. It means that it wasn't, there's not even a potential for it for those who were once enlightened. And this idea of being having your eyes open to the truth, okay, who were once enlightened who have tasted of the heavenly gift. 
So the gospel message is there. They understand about the love of God and the peace and the joy, and they understand it maybe in a technical sense, but they've never moved past the technical sense to appropriating it or making a part of theirs. That's one of the views. Tasted that heavenly gift, and they've become partakers of the Holy Spirit. So, this word partakers, this is one that I think is very important for us to understand. It is used only six times in the New Testament. Once it is used in the book of Luke, chapter 5, verse 7, and the context of that is when Jesus first meets his disciples. And they've been skunked all day fishing, and Jesus says, cast out, put down your nets, and take in a haul. And Peter's, of course, said, hey, you know, we, we've been skunked. And so we're professionals, you have no idea what you're talking about, we're fishermen, you're not, leave us alone kind of a thing. But they do, they go out. And so they, as we know the story, they catch so many fish that they have to say, hey you guys over there, our fellow guys, our partakers, the, your, your same word, our fellows, bring that other boat over here. Now were they just kind of fishermen? Or were they actually fellow fishermen? Because it's the same word, partakers. It's just used different in that, in, uh, it's a different English word, but it's the same Greek word. It means that they were just like Peter and the rest of the guys in that boat. They called over to the other fishermen, just like them, in that boat over there, and they brought in the hall. Interestingly enough, of the six times that this is used, once in Luke, every other use of this word is here in Hebrews. Every one of them. One of them is found in the first chapter, and it's in verse 9. We won't go there. And it's only the Greek translation from something that was in the book of Psalms. And it was when the writer of uh, Hebrews was talking about Jesus being greater than the angels. It takes a passage out of Psalm 45 at verses 8 and 9 and uh, um, applies it to Jesus. That that is when David wrote what he wrote, the writer of Hebrews says that was God the Father talking to God the Son and talks about his contemporaries, those ones that would be in the heavenly places. All the rest of these partakers passages are dealing with the people that are the addressees in this book. I just read one of them for you a moment ago, and it's in chapter 3. Let's look there one more time. Chapter 3, verse 1, says, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, same word, same word as the partakers in chapter 6, verse 5, or 4 rather. Um, exact same word. Partakers of the heavenly calling. Consider the apostle high priest of our confession. So if, if the one of the two uh, views of this is that they were people that came all the way up to the last moment but never actually got saved, then the exact same word here is used. And so that would mean that the whole book of the warnings when it becomes personal like it has been here is really not talking to believers but to almost believers. So that's how that view is. It kind of works throughout. Verse 14 of this, chapter 3, says this, For we have become, have become, past tense, we have become partakers of Christ if, assuming this, we hold fast the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. So there's the qualifier. We become partakers and it's evidenced by the fact that we become these partakers of, of this relationship with the Lord and we stay steadfast till the end. Now, there are those that would teach that from the moment that you get saved, there's nothing that you could do about it. There's, you know, once you get saved, you're saved and it doesn't matter, you're going to persevere. That's how you would know that you're part of the elect. But then you never really know you've got to die in that condition and that's really troublesome and for other, a whole bunch of other reasons. So, there's one other place you'll find this. It's in chapter 12, and it basically is the same thing. It's uh, at verse 8. Same thing. It's talking about the believers and, and them being partakers. Same Greek word. Other than that, you don't find this partakers of anything, this Greek word, anywhere else in the New Testament. So again, begs the question. Let's read it in uh, chapter 6. Let's go back there. Read it all at one time. For it is impossible... For those who were once enlightened, to have tasted the heavenly gift, have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, 
have tasted the, uh, the good word of God and the powers of the age to come or the strength that will be revealed in the ages to come that if they fall away to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and they put him to an open shame. Now, the last part of that, last clause in that is very difficult. I mean, I've not found anybody who gives a satisfactory answer of all the people that are really great on Greek. In fact, Chuck just goes, I cannot explain that to you. I don't know what that means in its fullness. I can't understand that. In the larger context of it, the idea that of the two camps, those people that came all the way up to the very edge and never quite got saved, then there's no hope for them. Well, I did that I don't know how many times. I got right up to the very edge. I knew everything that I needed to do, and yet I pulled back. But then I got saved at a later time, so I don't know how we can make the case that these people are right up to the very edge of things, because why warn them anyway? Eventually they're going to come to their senses and they'll get saved. It makes more sense to me that the warning is here to people who have gone to that point of their own free will and then also of their own free will abandon it. Now I know that that's controversial and people have a real problem with it, but this falling away, how do you fall away from something that, you know, if you're going to talk to people that, are, that have never been saved, wouldn't you be addressing them and make it very clear that that's who you're talking to? Hey, you people that are almost Christians, you almost saved people, let me talk with you a little bit. He seems to be talking to them as though they are of his fellows. Now, of course it begs the question, well, then how is anybody going to know anything? Does that you know, keep you up at night? No. I've read John 3.16. God so loved the world that whosoever believes will not perish but have eternal life. I'm secure in that. I can't be any more secure in that because I'm not even in the equation. I've believed and he's taken it from there. I'm just asked to walk and to abide with him. Now again, it's controversial. But once you have one of two options here. When you read this, to whom is the warning going? And since nobody can make an absolute impossible to get around, ironclad way of proving it, people are left to look at that and say, in the larger context of the entire chapter, or the entire book itself, plus a number of other warning places, can you warn somebody against something that's not a potential? And then at this point, he's writing to almost believers, not quite believers. And I, I just don't see it in the text. So anyway, verse 6 says then, so if they do, if it comes to this point, then they, uh, to renew them again to repentance. But I thought if they were almost believers, they wouldn't have repented, would they? Repentance is what believers do, so I thought. And repentance is what leads to the remission of sins, which is why we get the Holy Spirit in the first place. But again, you just got to ask yourself these questions and forget about whatever school of theology you've heard from. What does the text ask you? What does the text warn you against? And again, it's like with, I love Peter's response, and this was before Peter could have been born again. He was walking around with Jesus at the time in John chapter 10, and, or John chapter 6 rather, and uh, Jesus talks about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, and it flipped everybody out, remember? And those people said, I'm out of here. I can't take this. This is scandalous. And so then he looks at the disciples and Jesus asks them, are you guys going to leave too? Peter said the right thing. Well, where else are we going to go? I don't know where else there is. We've been there, done that. You've demonstrated something to us. You're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. Where else are we going to go? And I think if every person is there, every believer is there, well, yeah, indeed, where would you go? What else is there? We've all probably figured out something different and we left that because there was no life in it. So interesting, interesting here. So if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they would crucify again for themselves the Son of God and they would put him to an open shame. And I don't even know how that's possible. And certainly every one of us in this room, I'm sure, we probably didn't get saved the first time we ever heard the gospel. But there may be a few of you. But I would say that the overwhelming majority of us had probably heard the, the gospel over and over and over again before we finally bowed the knee. Yes, Lord, forgive me, cleanse me. So people of very good you know, scholarship and of very good will differ a little bit on that. Is it believers or is it almost believers? In either case, the warning is still the same. If you do deny these things, then there's no hope. Now that's even, to me, the larger issue here. 
So whatever anybody would want to propose about how to secure salvation for themselves, it is in and through the person of Jesus Christ and his finished, completed work on the cross. I can't add to it. I can't validate it. I cannot earn it by my actions, and no one else, no one else could either. Because it was all done, obviously, before we were ever born anyway, even if people thought that you could. All that we are asked to do is to hold on to this confidence, as we read in chapter 3. We are to endure and, and walk in faith. So, verse 7. 4. Gives us a, an earthly, if you will, uh, an analogy here. For the earth, which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it, and bears herbs useful for, for those uh, by whom it is cultivated, receives blessing from God. So, using it in, in this earthly sense, it's kind of the parable of the sower type of a mentality. So the earth is able to be seeded and water can fall upon it and then things come up and there's that whole growth and, and uh, all of that. So then verse 8 says, But if it bears thorns and briars, then it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. So what do you do with a field full of weeds? Burn it. If that's what fruit is produced, if you're expecting something else and what it brings forth is thorns, then it's not the intended fruit and the fruit is just going to be judged, in this case burned. Okay. So that would be anybody that's in a situation of unbelief if we use the analogy of the earth. Thorns is synonymous with, I don't care what it is that you've heard, but if your life is producing thorns and there's no fruit, no evidence of anything of the Lord, then it's pretty obvious that there's nothing going on with you in a spiritual sense. Now, I can just hear it in your minds already. Some of you, I can hear it. The gears are turning. But the fruit is not what it's supposed to be. That's not what the text is saying. And, and here, let me just make sure I, I settle a few of your hearts. <laughs> but, but the fruit, but there's, there's, there's thorns. And you're freaked out, right? Unsaved people don't care. So if you're worried about, uh, 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 am I even saved? Unsaved people wouldn't even ask the question. Okay? Now, I'm not making fun of you because you, I didn't hear any of you panting or you know, being breathless about the whole thing. I'm just saying, calm down, it's cool. We're all right. Besides, unbelievers don't usually go to Bible studies on Wednesday night. You could be anywhere else. It's, it's foggy outside. It's like pea soup out there. Did you guys know that? Yeah. yeah. It's changing the seasons, man. So, if you leave this place tonight and you're saying... I, I'm just, I'm really unhappy with the fruit and there's thorns. Praise the Lord. Because you could say, God, yank up the thorns and yank up the weeds and all the rest of it and I want to see you bring forth fruit in my life. He's going to say, great, go past your infancy, get into the word, grow by it. And he will always, in every single way, he will always take the person that comes to him that way. You can't earn your way to heaven, so don't try. So the last thing I'll say on that before we go to the next kind of section of this we are to produce fruit. There's no question about it. The Bible says that. And so people will, would say that the Bible contradicts itself because James, they always love to throw out faith without works is dead. So you've got to produce some works or else there's no faith. And then Paul would say, yeah, but it's not by works lest we boast. So which is it? Is it Ephesians 2, 8 through 10? Or is it James? Pretty much the whole book. Which is it? It's both. A person that is a believer is going to be able to demonstrate their walk with the Lord because of the things that are produced in their life. It's just obvious. Unbelievers do not produce godly fruit. It just doesn't happen. So, a person that's walking with the Lord, the evidence of that walk with the Lord, you become like the one that you serve. And the more that you know about who he is, the more that your life tends to move in that direction because it's pleasing to him. And you're walking in fellowship with him, so the fruit's going to be there. And if you're freaked out about your life right now, just ask yourself the question. What is my life right, like right now as opposed to the day that I first got saved? And is there evidence of my life in him? And has he done great things since that time? Now, great things is, of course, in the eye of the beholder. But if you have moved on since the day of your salvation, praise the Lord. If it's not as much as you want, then that's on you. It's not on God. He will offer up to you anything that you need in order to grow. We're usually the people that hold stuff back to ourselves, right? Isn't that kind of our nature? So, don't let this be one of those things that freaks you out. There's no reason to. Do you trust in Jesus right here, right now? 
Is he the one who has saved you? And, and if you died right now, are you settled with him? And does, it, does his blood cover and atone for your sin? And if you answer yes to that, then we don't need to talk about it. This warning is for somebody else. Okay? Walk with him. I can definitely tell you that, that if you die in a state of walking with him and trusting him, you have nothing to fear. Nothing to fear. So then, verse 9. But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Beloved. Better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. That's a way of, again, saying to people that may have been very troubled by what they were reading. Hey, look, we're not saying that this is going to happen with all of you. In fact, our hopefulness is that when you hear this, and when you take all things into consideration, perhaps it will get you to a place of just saying, don't want to even entertain the thought. So they, they turn towards it. And, and the writer here says, this is our confidence. This warning and laying out all of the arguments that he does in the book of Hebrews will bring them to a place where there's no longer this dispute, maybe even in their own minds. And it would keep some of them from going back to a system that cannot save them. So he says, we have greater, greater confidence, better things. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. For God is not unjust to forget your work and your labor of love, which you have shown towards his name. So these were people that were producing all kinds of godly things, godly works and all the rest of it. And he says, God, he's basically saying, God's not going to be unjust. He's not going to forget those things that you had done. He's paying attention. He's watching. And that, uh, that you have ministered to the saints, and you do, you still, you continue to minister. So we desire that each one of you would show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. So there is that idea of endurance. Continue on. Again, think about it when Paul talks about that you're running a race and there's a finish line. Have you ever seen anybody win a race standing still? Or jogging? If you're in a sprint, did anybody ever win a race jogging? Come on. It's a forward progression. Where else would you run? You don't run in any direction other than the finish line. If you're going to win a race, if you're going to run a race, same thing here. Same kind of a mentality. Forward progress. Don't worry about such things. And I find it's an interesting thing. When passages like this one come up, you, can almost, if you could almost think of it this way. If we were able to see it in a spiritual sense and we were all running in one direction and you come across one of these things, you see people kind of run off the side of the road and they sit there and think about it. They get so, you know, so freaked out about the whole thing that they quit running the race long enough to just take it all in and think, am I doing this, am I doing that, and I'm all freaked out and everything else, where you want to just say, keep running with the pack because the finish line's over there, and if you just keep your eyes there, you have nothing to fear. Stop thinking through this too much. Run. Go. Finish line. That direction. Well, that's going to freak you all out because you're all faced this way. Run that direction. So... We desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. That you do not become sluggish. Where's the sluggishness come from? It's the end of chapter 5. Indifference, apathy. I'm okay with milk. That meat stuff takes too much work. Show me a video. Entertain me. You see it in a nice light show. Whatever the case may be. Don't become sluggish but rather imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. What a great line that is. And this is where discipleship comes from. This is where, and there have been some people in my life over the years, I am forever indebted to them, though they don't even realize it that way. And if, they would say, if, if I was to say that to them, they would say, they'd slap me and say, take your eyes off of me, man. Keep your eyes on Jesus. But these were people that I watched for years, and they demonstrated a consistency and they didn't waver. They were people that I could say, when I grow up, I want to be like that guy. Those people. You want to keep your eyes on them. You want to be close to them. And even if they let you down, you still, your eyes ultimately have to be on Jesus. But you do know that there are those people around you that you want to be able to look to. You want to go to and ask. You want to see where they've come from. As I always put it, I love to get... I love to get around pastors and look for the guys with the most scars on their faces, spiritually speaking. Don't give me the young, cool, hip guy that looks great in skinny jeans and started being a pastor five years ago. I don't want to talk to that guy. He hasn't been through it. Show me the guy that's been through the wars. That's the guy that I'm interested in talking to. 
Because chances are, he's been through an awful lot of stuff. Now, you hear me talk about him all the time, but Jack, Jack went through some stuff. And I watched him go through about 20 years of it. 20 years of it. I saw some just wicked things said about him and done to him. And you watch all that stuff. And I asked more questions than you could possibly imagine. I heard him say more things that I have you know, taken into my confidence and thought about and, you know, just let them kind of go through my mind thinking if ever the time comes when I've got to deal with such a thing, boy, do I remember how best to handle it because I've watched somebody else have to go through it first. That is such an important thing in a church. Look to those people who have been there before. It's best, oh my gosh, is it best to ask questions of people who've been there. So we get those people that are given to us throughout the years, and we should be looking to them. So looking, imitate those who through faith and patience inherit these promises. What a great thing, because that gives us the understanding of the inheritances of promises right here and now that, that translate forward. Our promises are ultimately not in this earth, because our heritage is not in this earth, and our inheritance is not this earth, at least not in its current configuration. Not until the Lord transforms it and makes it brand new in the millennial kingdom and then in the forever kingdom. And then that's the earth that we inherit. Which again, for all those people that try to tell us that we're supposed to be building the kingdom of God right here, it tells me I inherit that. The kingdom and the promises therein. So, chapter 6, verse 13. He begins to wrap this up by giving us again confidence and though he has argued against so much of whatever trust they may have had in the Old Testament sense, he wants to bring them in to an understanding that the promises made back as far as Abraham have relevance to us even here, even now. So he says in verse 13, For when God made a promise to Abraham, and because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. Now, this is cool, because this sets up a whole, you know, a whole discussion. It's Psalm 138, I believe, where it says that, G, uh, that God has magnified his word above his name. Well, how could you possibly do that? His word is absolute, and his name, who's greater? And so that helps us to understand that that's, that's uh, in both cases, he is the supreme in all things. Now, we might have made... Uh, you know, uh, agreements with people, and there are people, think about it this way, let's say it a different way. Think about the people that you know best, and some of them that you wouldn't trust them to pick out wallpaper for you. Do we even buy wallpaper? Paint color, how about that? And if they could say, here, I'm going to do so and so, and you have my word on it, you would go, right. <laughs> your word means nothing. And it used to be that your word was your bond. We even have that whole phrase, right? My word is my bond. And you could just do things on a handshake. Now you need a lawyer and 50 pages of something just to make a simple agreement on things. But if you're God, you could say, this is my word and it's backed up by my name. So you don't get greater than any of the rest of that. So when God makes a, a promise to Abraham, and if Abraham was to say, well, who's going to be the guarantor of this promise? I am. I am, I am. <laughs> and so it's God is going to make good on that promise. And so he can't swear by anybody else. We used to do it when we were kids. I swear by my mom or my dad or, you know, well, you better make sure that you back that up or mom and dad are going to squash you because you use their name. Well, God doesn't look to any other greater authority. He is the only authority. And so when he gives you his word back by your name, there's no way to appeal it up the ladder. He's the top. So, when Abraham got this promise, and remember what the promise was. Uh, I want you to go to a land that you don't know of. I want to take you there. And I always love the, the saying about that. And so if, if that was to be, well, where is it? Well, you don't know where it is. Well, how are we going to get there? It's all that stuff. It's on a need-to-know basis, and you don't need to know. Now, when you get somebody to say that to you, how willing are you to go? And in this case, he was. But that's based upon a very, simple, a very simple fact, is that Abraham looked at him and said, he's worthy of my trust, because he's able and willing to make good on the promise. That's the same thing with the Christian. Because we've been told that there is a place called heaven, and there is but one way, Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Now, 
He's the one who said it. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Then you have to look at him and say, do I believe you, first of all, that you're the only way and that you will then take me since you've offered that to me? Are you worthy of my trust? We call it faith. Same thing with Abraham. And the promise that was made through him is laid hold of by us because that promise really included Jesus, which that's how this chapter ends out because it's going to get us to the idea of priesthood and, uh, and the idea of somebody mediating for us. For when God made a promise to Abraham because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself and he said, surely, blessing, I will bless you and I will multiply you. So this was chapter 15, chapter 12, son of the promise, all of that kind of stuff. So if you're Je uh, Genesis uh, 12 to 15, those areas there, that, that covers all of that. So, and so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. So he got to the place and uh, there were still mess ups along the way, right? Did you notice here that it doesn't even mention the whole thing with Hagar? Did you notice? He didn't even mention that goof up when they took it upon themselves. The promise was who? Isaac. Doesn't even deal with anybody else. So that whole goof up of Abraham and Sarah to do the thing and, you know, here, take my handmaiden, that was not the promise. The promise was from you two. You're going to have this. And so, notice that the, I love this about failure is not mentioned. Don't you appreciate it when God doesn't throw your failure in your face? Good. Somebody said yes. All right. And so, after he had patiently endured, he, had pay, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. So how do you settle any kind of, a, of a, a, a pact, if you will? Well, to them, there's a confirmation of this oath. Well, when he had the son in his hand, he obviously knew that the oath was made good, right? Hey, there's, there's Isaac. So, verse 17, thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of the promise the immutability of this counsel. The, it's, it's sure, it's absolute. There's no, no way to, uh, to remove it. He confirmed it with an oath. I give you this pact. I'm going to make a great nation out of you. Through you, the nations are going to be blessed. Now, only in a New Testament sense does any of that make sense. Because how do you bless the nations when you are making a covenant with one nation, singular? That being Abraham, that being his line of people. But how then do you make that extend to the nations, the plurality of humanity, even to the Gentiles? How does that possibly work in and through the person of Jesus? No question about it. So that helps the, the hearer of this, the, the readers of this Hebrews, to not go back to the law, which was just a covenant made with a people, but he's trying to get them to go forward to when God makes those promises to all of mankind, a blessing to the nations, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, he might have strong consolation. So what are these two immutable things? God made a promise, and then he backed up the promise with the weight of his name. Those are the, there's, there are your immutable promises. You cannot alter them. They are unalterable. God made a promise, and he'll back it up. <clears throat> so, because of that, you can have strong consolation. Who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope that is set before us. Refuge, Jesus, the one to whom we run. Now, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil. Now he's turning it towards Jesus. Because what laid behind the veil, but that was the mercy seat. That was where the Ark of the Covenant was. That's where the mediator went one time a year to atone for sin, right? We know that whole story. But I, I always love this, and, and the first person I ever heard tell this was Jack. Um, we've all seen the movie The Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? So when the guy popped off the lid and his face melted and all that stuff. It was beautiful, yeah, that's right. Well, what was in that, which we'll find later in, the, in Hebrews, talks about if you were to pop the lid off of that thing, what you would have represented in, in, inside was what? Three things. What three things were they? There were the commandments, the tablets, yeah, one. 
Abraham, uh, or uh, Aaron's rod, yeah, the one that budded, so we knew who it was. Then what else? It was the manna. It was a jar of manna. It lasted more than a day. Shocker, huh? So that's what was in there. But all of that was represented by the law, right? Or that all represents the law, does it not? The rod, that's Aaron. The law was the, that stuff, and, and the manna was what was prepared for them in their time in the wilderness. That was all stuff that was done under the law. So if you put the lid back on that, what's up on top? Mercy seat. What does that tell you? Mercy triumphs over the law. So there you have it. So when Jesus goes into the holy place, he goes there as a sacrifice making mercy possible. Couldn't come through the law. The law never brought mercy in an enduring sense. It was always having to be repeated. So in Jesus, settled. He brings peace. Mercy ensues. So this hope we have, and that, if you grasp what I just said, talk about an anchor. You can't move me from this. I have been brought into a relationship with the God who shows me mercy. And I know that because he went in and offered himself in my place. So there's no way around, there's no way around it. It's an anchor to the soul. It is sure, it is steadfast, can't be moved. And it enters the presence that's behind the veil. Where the forerunner has entered for us. Who's that? Jesus. He's referred to as a forerunner in other places in this book. He's the one that went first. There's nobody that's gone before. A forerunner is the first person to go. So, he's the one who went into that holy place. Now, there were other priests that went in there, right? So, Jesus wasn't the first person to ever go into the Holy of Holies. But he's a forerunner. So, he was the first. So, what makes him unique and what makes him different? That's what the chapter 7 is about. So, where the forerunner has entered for us. And if and there is any question, even Jesus having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, we had talked about that last week. Jesus does not qualify under the, the priesthood of the tribe of Levi from Aaron's descendants. He couldn't do it. Besides, that was under a covenant that the writer of Hebrews has been very careful to explain doesn't really exist any longer, at least that God would recognize now, there is one thing that's very important for us to recognize, too, when I say that. Anybody who has not put their faith and their trust in Jesus that has taken all of the consequence of the law away will stand before God guilty of the law. We realize that, right? Because God said perfection. That's what I require. No one will be able to endure my presence without perfection. Nobody can attain that. Only Jesus. And he has done so for us. So everybody else will stand before God saying, here's my works. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Even people that don't acknowledge him, God will say, not an excuse. Not an excuse. Interesting. So we're going to get into this Melchizedek guy next week as we get into this. So only a couple of places that he's mentioned, Psalm 110, uh, Genesis 14. So, a very intriguing character. But once again, we find that the book of Hebrews takes a few things that are out there that you could have had, you know, a handful of people that might have, well, I think it means this, and I think it means that, and it could be applied to this, and it could be applied to that. The book of Hebrews says, let me settle it, and there's no more debate. It settles the debate. Who is this Melchizedek, and how can Jesus do the things that he does? That gets settled for us beginning next week. Cool, huh? We're going to end a little bit early. I'm fried. I didn't know if my voice was going to actually make it, so this is cool. We're going to end about five minutes early. So let's stand. We'll have a closing word of prayer. Father, we thank you for gathering us here this evening, and we're so grateful for your word. And uh, I know that, that oftentimes these passages that can be troublesome to the hearer, God, you have asked us not to be in a place of, of uh, worry and concern. Salvation is a settled matter, and we know the means by which we can be saved. Lord, if there are any of us in here who are questioning what's going on in our lives, Lord, help us to realize that we are to keep our eyes upon you, that salvation is a known thing. We know exactly how to get there. If there is correction that needs to be in each of our lives or any of our lives, God, I pray that we wouldn't resist that correction, but that we would look to you for reconciliation, for cleansing. 
We give you thanks. We give you praise and honor that you have made these things clear, that we wouldn't be fumbling around not knowing. And so we thank you. We give you all the praise, the honor, and glory, and ask that you would be pleased with our lives. Walk with us and uh, have us to walk with you, that we would know you and grow in your grace and knowledge. We thank you and give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen? Good night. Hmm. Great.